Hello. Oh, there you are. Wonderful. There I am. How about that? <laughs> that's great. <laughs> okay. Well, Thank hopefully you. that's going to be all right. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. Okay. I'm no problem. Looking forward to it. Let's hope we don't have any more technical issues. <laughs> Okay, so okay. Um, you, wanted, you wanted to ask some questions? Um, yeah, so today I wanted to cover the topic of understanding and how to deal with manipulative people. And today we're talking with Dr. George Simon, who is the author of the best-selling book, In Sheep's Clothing. He's also a clinical psychologist with over 20 years of experience with covert aggression. It's my understanding from your book that you began recognizing this aggression through your patients who were describing, you know, depression, anxiety, insecurity, and you began to realize that almost always these were linked with relationships with manipulative people. Right. Yes. As a matter of fact, there's a term that's uh, come into vogue uh, recently because of one author's uh, uh, reintroduction of the term. The term is gaslighting. Uh, it, it, it's a, a borrowed term from the stage play and the movie of the same name, uh, Gaslight. People from the 50s will remember this uh, um, movie uh, made in the golden Hollywood era of this guy who wants to do away with his wife. Um, these days, that's a much easier thing to do. <laughs> uh, but uh, how the plot was, uh, he wanted to gain access to a fortune that was hidden in the house. He was going to send her off to the loony bin, making her think she was crazy. Um, and uh, so one of the authors uh, recently reintroduced this term, this kind of crazy making behavior that manipulators are so good at. And I don't actually uh, use the term gaslighting as, a, as an individual tactic. Rather, all of the tactics that manipulators use are meant to make you feel a little crazy. They're meant to make you doubt what your gut tells you is going on with the person who's trying to get the better of you. If they can make you think they're doing anything but trying to pull the wool over your eyes, trying to take advantage of you, uh, if they can make you think they're doing anything but that or make you doubt when you suspect that that's what they're doing, uh, then they're home free. That's how they succeed in manipulating you. That's why I call their behavior covert aggressive. They're determined to win, determined to have their way, determined to get the better of you, but they're very stealthy and very covert about the way they go about that and the, and the tactics that they use. And this produces a kind of gaslighting or crazy-making uh, kind of uh, effect. And this is what I was seeing in so many patients. Uh, they were coming in. They, they just knew in their gut that there was something wrong with their relationship partner. But that partner had the thinking they were crazy. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's what made them feel uh, so unnerved and many times depressed. I think that's one of the hardest parts is like you just feel like something's really wrong, but you can't quite pinpoint it. You can never pinpoint it. You end up feeling crazy. You end up feeling confused. You end up feeling self-doubt, the crushing sense of guilt and the blame and responsibility you end up taking on that relationship yourself. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And many times, too, it doesn't matter so much what tactics are being used, but many times a good manipulator will display an intensity of conviction. This is a good tactic in itself, whereby they seem uh, so sure that they make you doubt. Right. Uh, and uh, this is another way of kind of uh, crazy making behavior. Right. He who has the most confidence, everybody gets, yeah. yeah Wins. Or, yeah. <laughs> or he who displays it anyway. Right. You know, like the, like the, the serial philandering spouse who, who in, in apparent outrage and, and conviction said, you know, it says, you know, there's nothing to this. We're not going to discuss this. You know, I'm incensed and it displays all this phony kind of, um, 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 indignance. Uh, it looks convincing, and the yes. person begins to say, "Oh my gosh, have I just have I just been like the worst accuser ever?" You know, 
Right. Maybe, maybe, maybe those texts I saw on the phone really were as innocent as as they say, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You you know the story. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And like you mentioned in your book, like the big key is to be able to identify those tactics, because until you have the awareness of what's happening, of what those tactics are, it's so hard to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And like I tell uh, my clinicians that I train in workshops, you know, this year I'm doing a ton of training. Uh, once again, I, I for a while I had to take a hiatus from that, but I'm doing several tours this year. And like I, I, I tell all the clinicians that I train, uh, fortunately, these folks tend to rely on a, 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 a certain number of tactics that are tried and true. And so if you listen carefully for uh, the things they say, not to the things they say, but for the things they say, the kinds of things they say, the kinds of, of tactics that they're using, uh, observing how they, you know, when they're, when they're making that, that, that plausible sounding rationalization or excuse making, you know, when they're doing that behavior over and over and over again, that's your tip off, you know. And so I, I train clinicians to be on the lookout for these behaviors. They tend to rely on a, a few of them. I mentioned the, the most popular ones in my book. But, you know, the fact is that a good, a, a really skilled manipulator is capable of using just about anything. Because what they do is they prey on the conscientiousness of the other person. Right. They count on the fact that their victim has this thing we call a conscience, whereby they have qualms, they have unsureness about themselves, they want to do right, they don't want to be overly judgmental, they don't want to make a wrong judgment, they certainly wouldn't want to read somebody wrongly um, or, or misconstrue a situation, they want to get it right, and the manipulator knows this right. and preys upon this. That actually brings me to one of the questions I wanted to ask you. You know, what I hear from a lot of people, and I mean, they can be living in different countries, from different cultures, from different races, even speak different languages, from different socioeconomic statuses. And what everybody says is like, did they all read the same book? Like, how do they all have these exact same <laughs> yeah. strategies? What's yeah. your take on that? Well, it, it, the reason is because people with impaired consciences know how consciences work. Hmm. They not only know that they don't have the same kind of conscience, but they know how people with consciences work. So they know, for example, that people with good consciences want to make fair, honest judgments about people. So when they play innocent, when they feign confusion, when they offer that rationalization, they're playing to that. They're basically saying, I know that you don't want to necessarily see me as evil as I am. I know that. So if I appear to you as anything but the schmuck that I am, <laughs> I, I'm home. I'm home free. I win. And that's how it works. And that's why they, they, they all do play out of the same playbook, because they know how consciences work. So they definitely understand that they don't have that conscience then that most of us have. This is the big thing that people tell me, you know, In Sheep's Clothing will be in print this September 20 years. It's never lost any momentum in bestseller status in that whole time. And it's now in 17 foreign languages. Wow. Why? Because this phenomenon is everywhere. And the second reason is because when people finally get it, that they really do see, in my workshops, I train the clinicians I, with little rhyming phrases. I say, it's not that they don't see, it's that they disagree. And it's not that they don't care, it's not that they're not aware enough, it's that they don't care enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and as soon as people trust their gut and understand that, because they suspect that all along, they suspect that. But popular psychology had them believing that most people are unaware. And, and they just don't really see what they're doing. And they hate 
the conscientious people hate to rush to judgment. But these folks know what they're up to. They know exactly what button, buttons to push, how hard to push them, um, and just how to get the better of you, which is how they do it. Do you think that their behaviors are always self-aware, like they're always aware of what they're doing? Do you think sometimes there's maybe a lack of awareness of what they're doing, that it's just like a reflexive kind of thing? Yeah, you know, this is the, this is the thing that um, I think... I'm going to brag a little bit. Uh, I was on the forefront of 20 years ago. We now know, we now know that many psychological conditions exist along a spectrum. We, for example, we know that now with autistic disorders. We know that these nice little pigeonholes that we used to have just really don't exist. There are, say, for instance, people on the autistic spectrum who are, you know, really severely autistic and then there are people all along the spectrum from very mildly impaired to where you'd barely notice it and where it looks like something else entirely maybe it looks like just a little obsessive compulsiveness um but because it's not quite asperger's but it's somewhere along the spectrum well we know this about what i call the the character disturbance spectrum and i and i make the point that everybody falls along the spectrum at one extreme would be neurosis, which is where people are basically unaware and hung up versus char pure character disturbance where they are very aware and not hung up at all, but just nefarious, <laughs> just uncaring, uh, just deficient in empathy in human concern, in human regard, uh, feeling entitled, uh, etc. And everybody falls along that spectrum somewhere. So, uh, yes, it is possible. Yes, it is possible that someone who lies along the spectrum is sometimes and to some degree unaware of what they do. But it's a very dangerous assumption to make in our day and time. Because we have far more people, unfortunately, because of the cultural climate of our time, we have far more people who are more on the character disturbs, disturbed side of the spectrum. Right. Yeah. And besides which, when it comes to behavior, it doesn't make a difference. Whether they're aware or not, it really doesn't matter. They really need to change their behavior. And as I, t as I instruct my, uh, the folks at attending my workshops, the clinicians, we have this crazy notion that we have to work with people's heads to make them see. Actually, all we really need to do is change their behavior. Uh, and that will help them see. I, I, and I give the example of my son, my grandson, Noah, who I was just complaining about for messing up my camera here uh, on my computer. Uh, when he was about four years old, he really believed we have a pool in our backyard. He really believed that if he if, that if he dove into that pool, that he would not come back up, Aww. that he would go into the water and that would be the end. Aww. So he wouldn't do it. Now, he really believed this. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to reason with a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you can talk to your blue in the face trying to get him to see. You could even try to get him to see that his sister jumped in the pool Aww. and she came back up. <laughs> and his uncle, he jumped in the pool and he came back up. You know, you can, you can try to work with somebody's head to get them to see. But you know what happened eventually? One day, he, he jumped off one of the steps. And then one day, he let his dad throw him up in the air and land in the pool. And he went just a little bit under. And then slowly, progressively, you know, by the time he's six years old, he's diving in the pool. And he no longer thinks that he won't come up. He's got this whole new awareness. As a matter of fact, his whole outlook on the whole enterprise <laughs> has changed. And it changed because he changed his behavior. Right. So 
we waste an awful lot of time. People do this in relationships too. And clinicians are the worst people on this. They try and reason with people, try and get them to see this is a waste of time and energy. That's an excellent Chain point. Yeah. It's not, the point isn't whether they're aware or not. The point is the behavior is happening. We need to do something about the behavior. Right. And if there is an awareness problem, that awareness will come with the change in behavior. So many people go to therapy with their character disturbed partners and get so frustrated and re-victimize. Sometimes they experience what I call therapy induced trauma because not only don't they get any help and their partner doesn't get any better, but sometimes the therapist gets snowed, bamboozled, impression managed, as we call it. And, it, and, it, and then the person feels even crazier than they did when they first came in. It's a waste of time and energy and money to try and reason with person with a character disturbance. You change the behavior. Everything else comes later. It's that simple. That makes a lot of sense. I think that's a big point that a lot of people get stuck on is like trying to rationalize, well, is it, are they aware of what they're doing or are they not? As if, if they're unaware, then it almost like gives them this out for their behavior. But that's not reasonable, actually. Yeah. And, you know, when they promise that things are going to be different, you know how I know that they're lying? I know they're lying because right there in the session, in that here and now moment, they didn't behave any different, <laughs> right? You know, it's, it's one thing to talk, as they say in the 12-step programs, to talk the talk that things are going to be better. It's another thing to walk the walk, to actually do the things that produce changes. And that always happens in the here and now moment. So that means if somebody's in my office and they're rationalizing or they're minimizing or they're blaming others, these are tactics I'm labeling here, uh, that needs to stop and be replaced with a more appropriate behavior. And then we'll reinforce their willingness to do that, to change course, basically, to change tact. And that's what produces overall change um, and necessary insight uh, eventually. I think one of the biggest struggles for the targets, the victims of these manipulators is the hope for change, the hope that their partner will change. Yeah, yes. And so I'm, I'm curious, you know, what your experience is, you know, from what we read about narcissism and, you know, antisocial personality disorder and all that, these people just don't change. In your clinical experience, you know, how, how often do you ever see these, you know, covert manipulators change their behaviors, change their ways? Okay, I'm going to go back to the autistic spe spectrum analogy. How many severely autistic children have you seen that with years of therapy are normal? Probably none. Right. Now, how many autistic children on the spectrum who have some degree of autism but get the right kind of highly specialized intervention early enough can function almost near normally. Right. Right. There's two, two variables. One, recognizing the problem for what it is and how serious it is. And two, this is the biggie, the right kind of intervention. And traditional therapists don't know how to do it. Right. So, so it's so easy for them to just say, well... You can't do anything about it anyway, and then everybody else believes the same thing, too. That's a bunch of malarkey. <laughs> I have worked in this field 25 years plus as a clinician. I've actually studied the problem well over 32 years. Um, but 25 years specializing in this work, I enjoy it. I've watched thousands of people, thousands of so-called hopeless cases change, change big time. But I had to throw away every single mindset I had <laughs> that in, my, in, in the, the way I was trained. I had to discard just about every perspective that I was given about how to help that happen. What do you think from your experience is like the impetus that makes a person want to change? 
Well, many times, unfortunately, the pressure is external. You know, the motivation is external. Uh, the partner's had enough and is threatening to leave. There's money at stake. Uh, maybe uh, there's problems on the job. Maybe there's been repeated problems on the job. Maybe uh, the person is involved in, uh, in something that's become a near addiction or obsession and is draining the bank account. Uh, a lot of reasons. External motivation is probably the, the, the worst kind of motivation, <laughs> uh, the least uh, helpful in, in the long <laughs> run, the least promising, uh, because the, when the pressure's off, then the motivation goes. Um, so it depends. What really, and this goes against, too, what, what uh, so pop psychology has been saying for 50 years. And by the way, there's research to support this now. In the last 11 years, there's been solid research telling us how wrong we were about this. But where I've seen people really change is when they finally have a healthy sense of shame mm. uh, develop. We were told that shame is always toxic and a bad thing. You don't condemn the person, you only condemn the behavior. And you don't, you don't cast aspersions on the person's character, you only talk about the behavior. It's okay for them to feel guilty, it's damaging to their self-esteem for them to feel shame. I can tell you this, I've worked with some of the most severely disordered characters, including people who have spent much of their lives in prison. Not one person, not one, who really turned their lives around did so out of a sense of guilt. I know people, I know abusers, for example, who felt badly every time they beat the crap out of their partner. It never stopped them. Wow. They did it again. It was only when they took that look in the mirror and finally decided that they didn't like who they saw. Wow. It was only when they had a healthy, not a toxic, but a healthy sense of shame about who they were as a person, about who they had allowed themselves to become, what their identity had become. When they became uncomfortable with that, things changed. We've had it 100% absolutely wrong about shame. So how do they get to that point? Like how, how do they get to that miraculous ah. <laughs> shame point where they decide to change? You're going to ask me to give away all the tricks of the oh, trade. Oh, okay. <laughs> but this is, this, is, this, is why I'm, this is why I'm going around the country doing all this training again. Because one of the things that we as clinicians used to not do is we never touched character issues. In other words, we were taught you don't judge. In character construction, in what I call character constructive therapy, you make judgments all the time. Some things are just not good. You make those judgments. You lay those principles out there. They got to know who you are, what you stand for. And they also have to know that it's not just about the behavior, but it's about self-definition. Who are you going to be? And I give examples of this, powerful examples in my trainings that, that kind of send the message home. Uh, depending on whether or not uh, this would go anywhere else, I would, I would give you such an example. Uh, uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll give an example, but I, I, I don't want you to, to um, use it anywhere else. Is that okay? What do you mean not use it anywhere else? I, I wouldn't want anybody else to hear this example. Should I delete this part from the video then? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, but this, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Now, you see, this is what I tell my clinicians. If you will address, if character is the issue, if you will dare to address it, you would be amazed sometimes what can happen. Wow. But if you won't touch it, if you won't even go near it, how the heck is anything ever going to happen? Right. If all you want to do is deal with the surface level stuff, 
that doesn't matter in the long run as much as character. Well, no big surprise, nothing happens. Now, you can make judgments. You don't condemn. You've got to be directive. People who are basically four years old emotionally, they need to be told how to, how to be mature. Okay. <laughs> they need to know what to do, <laughs> where to go. And then you have to reinforce them and encourage them. But it can't be done. I've made a lifetime of it. And it's actually fun. You know, it's not only fun because it's no longer like pulling teeth. Uh, it's, it's fun because I enjoy watching people change and grow. It's in, it's in the how. I call the art benign confrontation. You know, it's you and me, buddy, and it's about who you are. And it has to be gentle. It's kind of like a tough love. And they have to they have to know that the regard is there. They have to know that. But they also have to know it's about who they want to be, how they're going to define themselves, what their values are going to be, what their commitments are going to be to. And that's what we deal with. All the other stuff is just fluff. You know, we have a communication problem. Well, the reason you have a communication problem is when, he, is when he or she talks to you with that filthy mouth, he has no regard for you as a person. <laughs> right. That's what needs to change. He doesn't have to learn new words. He knows different words to use. He just doesn't care to use them. <laughs> Don't you see, Mr. Smith, that if you... Of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> but browbeating works better. <laughs> uh. <sighs> so what do you say to your patients who come to you telling you a story about, you know, this character disturbed person in their lives, whether it's their, you know, intimate partner or someone at work or someone in their family when it just really looks like this person's just not going to change, like they're at that extreme end, you know, and, and the hardest struggle for that victim is letting go of that hope so that they can, you know, leave that person and get on with their life. How do you work with them? Yeah. You're talking about the slot machine syndrome. That's yeah. what I talk about in sheep's clothing. And uh, in my book, Character Disturbance, I talk about it too. Um, and also in my, uh, my new book with uh, Kathy Armistead, How Did We End Up? Here, uh, uh, I talk about that a lot. It's a phenomenon because the person's put all that investment into this relationship. And what, what, what they're really dreading is losing that investment, walking away from it. And they want to hold out any shred of hope that they haven't lost everything. Uh, it's a real grieving process. They're trying to stave off a pretty significant depression. And so they, they want to cling to that last bit of hope uh, when what they really need to do is just like with a slot machine. What you really need to do is cut your losses because <laughs> it will fleece you. It will. That's what it was designed to do. Right. <laughs> right? And just like these people, those one-armed bandits, just like these people, they are, they are programmed to every now and then give you that little ray of hope that makes you think, oh, you know, yep. maybe, just <laughs> maybe, you know, if I stick in there, you know, then I won't look like such a fool, you know, right. For, right, <laughs> for having invested all this time. But you get taken to the cleaners. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I work with that slot machine syndrome a lot. Um, and it's really all about staving off de depression. And how people get that way, I, it's very interesting. I, I, I do this in my training, too. I, I, I illustrate this for the therapists that attend. Uh, there was a great researcher who, who um, a researcher, by the way, who, has, who was a strict behaviorist and who poo-pooed the whole notion of character. And he's now like the biggest proponent. He, he just had this epiphany oh. in his old age. He said, 
character matters ever, uh, after all, and I quote him in my book, Character Disturbance. But anyway, one of his great research experiments uh, had to do with the, the paradigm of learned helplessness. This is basically where you put animals in a situation where nothing they do makes a difference in controlling the outcome. And this is the exact experience that people in relationships with manipulative and other disturbed characters have. They try this and they try that and they try everything. They try reason. They try modifying their own behavior. They, they try encouragement. They, 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 try therapy. they try everything and nothing seems to make a difference. And then they end up feeling helpless and hopeless and depressed. And what I do to bring them out of that is show them where their power is. Where they have power is over their own behavior. They have the power to take action. And so as soon as they stop thinking about that character disturbed person in their life, what are they going to go? What are they going to do next? What am I? What situation am I going to have to clean up next because of what they do? What do I say to get him to do this, or what do I say to get him to do that? As soon as they get out of that mindset and they turn inward and start saying, what do I need and what am I going to do to get it? What rules am I going to set? What limits am I going to set? What boundaries am I going to enforce? What expectations are am, am I going to lay down firmly and, 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 and insist upon? Everything changes. They start, <laughs> they get their energy back. They start feeling empowered. Right. Because the power is in their own behavior, their own self-awareness of what they're doing to enable it. Right. It's so, hard, it's so hard to let that other person go, though, in so many respects. Because they've been, they've been basically trying to nursemaid this person to health, uh, f you know, for years. And they got caught up in it. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm also curious, what do you think is at the heart of the covert manipulation? Like, why do they do it? What drives them to do that? It works. Ha. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's so effective. Now, you know, just try one of these tactics like guilt tripping or shaming. Try one of those tactics on somebody who doesn't have a very good conscience. Just try guilting the crap out of somebody who doesn't care and just try shaming somebody who doesn't have an ounce of shame in them try it sometimes see how successful a manipulator you are so it doesn't work right normally what happens is they'll flip it back right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so what they figured out is that it works with people who are conscientious these tactics work and it's a way to get what they want. You know, we all, this is so natural, it's human. And this is the other big bone that I had to pick with traditional psychology. Traditional psychology is obsessed with people's fears. It's obsessed with people's fears. Everything is anxiety, this anxiety, that things people run from. Uh, people who are, people who are rabid sensation seekers who use people as objects and have an infinite number of one-night one stands because their life needs to be a thrill a minute, they're described as commitment-phobic. Right. <laughs> we are obsessed with seeing everything as a fear within the traditional psychology paradigm. But the fact is that we are primarily fighters from, from yay high, from, from, from when we're just infants. We fight for the things that we want that's natural, that's normal, and if we do it in a, in a civilized way, it's healthy. But these folks are unfair fighters. They're dirty little fighters. They're covert fighters. And they've learned that it works. Especially it works with really conscientious people. Right. So. That was actually the biggest needle mover for me. Reading your book, actually, first I saw one of your videos, and then I got your book. When you were talking about how these behaviors are not defensive, they're not unconscious, they're offensive behaviors, right. that was huge for me to understand. Could you comment a little on that for people who ha who haven't read? Yeah, that yet? sure. Yeah, and then this is, you know, this is to 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 think 
that this is even still illuminating for psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers and licensed counselors and marriage and family therapists who attend my workshops to think that this is still new news to them when I train them on this is just, it's mind boggling to me because we are so steeped in these old paradigms. But, you know, we used to think, for example, I, 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 in my workshops, I talk a lot about the so-called defense mechanism of denial. Um, and I ask the clinicians to explain to me what denial is. And then they'll give me an example. And it's clear they haven't got a clue what real defense mechanism denial is. First of all, it's unconscious. The person has no idea they're doing it. Denial is not lying. It's not refusing to admit the obvious. You know, you, you caught them red-handed. There's that text on the phone. It says they want to meet them next week at a certain hotel and do the, the little thing. It says it right there, right? And sa saying, well, you're still reading it wrong as a tactic to try and convince you you're still crazy and you haven't really nabbed them, that is not denial. <laughs> it's a fighting tactic <laughs> designed to get off the hook and they know full well what they're doing and they just pray that you're still conscientious enough that you'll doubt and they'll get away with it one more time. <laughs> right. You know, uh, Real defense mechanisms are unconscious. The person has no clue they're doing them. And they're designed to mitigate overwhelming emotional pain and anxiety. The unconscious does this for the person so that they wouldn't be in extreme pain, intolerable pain. And I give examples of what that kind of thing looks like. For example, I give an example of real denial. I, I, in my book, Character Dis disturbance. I give this example. Uh, and I do so in my book, How Did We End Up Here? Uh, also, uh, uh, I, I give the example of, of, of an elderly couple who has been working out in the yard, uh, doing the gardening that they always do on a Saturday afternoon. And all of a sudden, the, the gentleman kind of looks strange in the face, and his speech becomes a little slurred, and he seems to have trouble maintaining his balance. And the next thing you know, he's passed out on the ground. And the next thing you know, he's in an ambulance on the way to the ER. And the next thing you know, the ER nurse comes out and says, he's had a stroke. And the next thing you know, the doctor comes out and says, he's had a very massive stroke. And for all intents and purposes, he's gone. Mm. And the woman is not ready for this. And so she stays by his bedside and she holds his hand and she talks to him. And the nurse says, he can't hear you, but she talks to him anyway. And uh, she squeezes his hand, and the nurse says, he can't feel that. And she squeezes his hand anyway. Now, is she just a liar? No. No. Is she just constantly refusing to listen to reason? No. Is she trying to make the nurse think that they're crazy? No. No. Her unconscious is protecting her from the grief that she will inevitably have when she's ready for it. But she's not quite ready. Just 20 minutes ago, they were in the garden. Now they're telling her he's gone. She's not quite ready yet. And her unconscious is protecting. She doesn't even know she's doing it. Right. And it's protecting her against pain that's too unbearable. Now, there's beauty in those, those old formulations that saw these defense mechanisms, they're real. There are such things as defense mechanisms. But the way that we extended the terms 
and defined these behaviors and made them all defense mechanisms when they weren't right. was our error. It was an error in our perception. It was an it was an overrepresentation and an unfair extension of what Sigmund Freud had discovered. We did that. It was our mistake. We framed it wrong. And because we framed it wrong, we taught other people to frame it wrong too. And that's what trapped them in their relationships because they see these things and they think, oh, you know, they really don't realize what they're doing. Right. Maybe they really believe that. They're saying to themselves. Right. And then when the light go bulb goes off because they read the book and they think, you know, and, that, and then when on top of that, when they, when they call them on it and said, you know, by the way, I've read the book. I know what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. And then the, then the person fesses up. Yeah, right. Oh, you got, you got. <laughs> <laughs> it's like everything changes. I, I probably get 50 emails a month from people who say that that light bulb moment is what changed their life. Right. There's nothing more edifying than that. Right. Nothing more edifying than that. I, if for, I mean, for all the labor that it took and all the toil that it took to, to, uh, to write that first book, that alone is worth everything. If, you know, if anybody has that light bulb moment and it changes the nature of their relationship and for the first time uh, they're not going to be bamboozled anymore, I, I couldn't ask for anything more. That's truly the most powerful thing I got from this was when, you know, you were describing the difference between being motivated by fear and motivated by deny by desire. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The cat analogy you made. Yes. Yeah. And by the way, that was given to me by uh, a, a great clinician and researcher by the name of Reed, Reed Malloy. He uh, is based out of San Diego and he's done a lot of work with psychopaths, actually. Um, and uh uh, that, that that was his analogy. Wow. I, I've kind of expanded on it a little bit, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that just made it so real. When I when I could look at it like that, it just it, I finally like got it because I think I kept you know unconsciously going back to that. Well, maybe it's based on the fear of some sort, some insecurity. That's why they're like this. The abuse of their past. You can't pick up a pop psychology book from the '60s through the '80s without. Hearing those same things. We even thought that way about bullies. Underneath it, what were they? Bullies. Underneath it all, they were really insecure, fraidy cats. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just garbage. It's just garbage. You know, they're saying the same thing now about Donald Trump. Right? Oh, God. <laughs> Com compensating, compensating for size inferiority. Blah, blah, blah. And that's just that... All this ridiculous stuff when there just simply are people out there without empathy. Right. And some don't even have the capacity for it. There's something wrong with them right from the get-go. And in some cases, we know that the brains aren't working, working the same. There's still not enough evidence to say that their brain is constructed differently from birth. That's a misinterpretation of the data. A lot of people are saying that. That's a very big misinterpretation of the data. But we do know that their brains work differently. Wow. Yeah. Based on the functional MRI scans, is that how? Yes. Okay. Right. Right. So do you, do you think it's predominantly the nurture aspect then? Yes, always both. And the extent to which... Nature versus nurture has the greater weight in shaping someone's development varies, uh, which explains why, which explains why some people come out of the most horrendous, out of the most horrendous kinds of environments and turn out unbelievably well. And some people have just about everything you could ask for and turn out just Awful, right. <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> you know, the the uh, the 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 uh, how strong a factor in the development of a person, nature versus nurture, is varies. It varies, and once again, I would say that when it comes to intervention, it doesn't make any difference. Because 
because you can't undo their history and you can't reprogram their genes. Right. Okay? What has to change is their behavior. Right. This is the great human capacity. Of all the creatures on the planet, we have this incredible capacity to learn. And we also know that our brain, as plastic as it is, changes with new learning. Right. So we can learn to be better. If we if want we, to. <laughs> if we, well, not only if we want to, but if we're reinforced for it. Right. You know, there are so many things in our culture, unfortunately, that reinforce dysfunction. Right. Why does a, I'll pick on Donald again. Why does a person like Donald Trump not even consider changing his ways? Because it works. Right. Thank you very much. I got what I want. Right. <laughs> got plenty of money. Got the new babe. Right. Number five. Got, got this. Got that. You know. Hey, convince me I really need to do this all right. the <laughs> That's very true. So, you know, we have to look at the climate that we have created. This climate of entitlement, greed, disregard this incredible egocentricity, this me, 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 now, 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 uh, zeitgeist of our time. Oh, man. This is the other point that I make to my clinicians. I, I point out that Sigmund Freud was not crazy, but he was dealing with the phenomenon of his time, the Victorian era, a horribly repressive era. Massively repressive. So people were nervous wrecks. That's not our time. Right. People are That's not our time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember hearing that in one of your videos, you know, the anxiety, the guilt, right, from being repressed versus now, not nearly that much. No. I think that's where Confucius got things right. You know, he said, start with the individual, get the individual right. The individual gets right. The family gets right. The family gets right. Society gets right. I think it starts with each one of us. It's, it, it's, it, Confucius had it right because it's the right place to intervene. It, 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 is a, it is a true vicious cycle. The fact that our social traditions and, and our cultural climate are so unhealthy is producing more character impaired people. But it's also because there are more character impaired people right. that we keep having these so we keep having the societal decay. And Confucius is right in the fact that when you when you look at the 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 entire cultural climate to to change that to, to make that your focus and, 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 and to change that, that's, that's a daunting, almost impossible enterprise. But you can change one heart at a time. Right. And that's what has to happen. And uh, that's really where my work has been. I, I have enjoyed cultivating what I call this, uh, this benign confrontation, character constructive kind of therapy where I work with one heart at a time and I just call them out on their crap in a, in a, in a loving but firm kind of a tough love way. And, um, you know, basically ask them to consider how they want to define themselves in character. Like it matters. And that's why I call my radio program Character Matters, too, because I think it does matter. It, it, it matters more than anything. I can't, I can't believe that in the United States today, we have seen this cavalcade of shameless characters before us, all who want to be our leaders. Right. What a sad, sad statement. Right. There's one I have respect for. 
<laughs> There's one. Not a chance in heck that this is going to be press president. Not a chance. <laughs> right. It's pretty sad. So we got to start. I, ac I actually have about ten more minutes. So um, if, if you have other questions, uh, go ahead. It's getting to be almost yeah. the top of the hour here. You know, I think that's basically all that I have. I just want to thank you again so much, Dr. Simon, for taking the time to share this with me and with my tribe today. I'm going to put this video out later. I'm really, really grateful for the time and just all the efforts that you've invested. Like this book changed my life. No doubt it's changing so many other lives. I'm incredibly grateful. Well, I'm proud of all my books. I, I'm particularly proud of Character Disturbance because it really tells people that the the complete spectrum of disturbed characters and especially what the kind of therapy that can really help looks like. Oh. And I'm proud of the Judas syndrome because for people uh, in the faith community, in the Christian faith community, I, 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 it makes it real. It makes it real about the power of faith to help transform and elevate a person's life. And, um, I, I'm really proud of my book with Kathy Armistead, How Did We End Up Here? Because so many people in dysfunctional relationships, either in the middle of the relationship or toward the end, are really scratching their heads and trying to figure it out because they don't want this to happen again. And they don't, they don't want to carry into their next relationship the same vulnerabilities that might have uh, worked to their disadvantage this last time. And so, you know, they're, they're scratching their heads, they're trying to figure it out. And so that's why we wrote, How Did We End Up Here? And we have another book coming out at the end of the summer called The Ten Commandments of Character. It's my, it's a summary of my experience about the life lessons my character impaired people have had to learn, whether they were youngsters uh, having a tough time as children or adults or, or as teens or adults needing to rebuild a life. The life lessons that our children have to learn and, and everybody has to learn in order to have the kind of character that we want them to have. Um, and so that will be coming out at the end of the summer. I'm hanging that up in edits. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm my worst critic and uh, I'm not happy with it just yet, so I'm, I'm hanging it up. It's mostly written, but I'm hanging it up in edits. That's okay. great to know. So around the end of the summer to look for that one. Right. Okay. And then, of course, my blog at manipulative-people.com and the you other blog that I write for. You mentioned a radio show? Where? where uh-huh. That... Character Matters, Sunday nights on ucy.tv, Sunday uh, at, at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, time, 6 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Pacific. How would someone access that online? Is it uh, UC, UCY.TV. Awesome. UCY.TV. Uh, not TV yet, just radio only, but soon to be TV. Awesome. Uh, every Sunday night. And people can call in. They can ask me questions, share stories. That's great to know. And, you. and your, your network looks great, by the way. I, 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 I've been to your site. Um, um, let's see here. I think I have it pulled up here. Uh, I, I, the um, self-healing for uh, victims of narcissistic abuse. And I, I like your little acronym, too. Thank you. Um, and I see that you've got some... Uh, I see you've got a webinar series, yes, and an audio co course. Right. Interesting. I, I have. I haven't. I haven't visited those yet, but I. Uh, but I will. Awesome. I so, appreciate it. Thank best, you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Best to luck. Uh, of luck uh, in your work. And, Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed our interview and. So uh, did I. Maybe, Maybe we can do it again sometime. Yeah, I'm going to read your next two books and then the next one coming out. And maybe after that, we'll have another interview. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Simon. You're welcome. Take All care. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.